You know, Anthony Mason was one of my favorite Knicks from the 90s era. And it's been six years now since his passing. And I wanted to have a special podcast to celebrate his life. And, and joining me today is someone that knows him the best. It's his son, Antoine, checking in from Spain. Antoine, how you doing today, man? Thanks for joining me. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. And as I say, you know, your father was one of my favorite players, man. Number 14, the style, the grit, the New York energy, the passion that he brought to the game. You know, he was he was a soul. He was the heart and soul of the, of the 90s era, man. And, um, you know, I just wanted to bring you on just to shed some light on, on who he was. Uh, but, we, you know, we know him more as a basketball player. I want to hear from you. Who was Anthony Mason, the man and, and the father to you? Um, he was my best friend. Uh, we could talk about anything, sports, anything about life. Uh, funny. He loved, he loved playing jokes, loved joking on people. Um, kind hearted, you know, you see the tough, uh, physical person on the court, but on the, uh, off the court, he would do anybody, uh, anything for anybody. Kind, kind hearted person. What were some of the life lessons that he taught you just coming up as a kid? Um, pretty much everything, uh, from basketball, he taught me his experiences, the good and the bad. Um, he always said he made the mistakes so I could learn from it. And, um, off the court, it was just, you know, being a, a good person, uh, respecting people and having a hard, uh, work ethic. When you remember your, your basketball journey as a kid, how was he as, as a basketball dad? Was, was he that, you know, active coach always in the ear encouraging you? Or did he kind of, you know, let you do your thing and, and make your own mistakes? How was he? Oh, uh, he was the coach. <laughs> he was definitely a coach. Uh, when I was on the court, you could definitely hear him and my mom um, yelling, cheering me on. And then um, it started developing from me being a little kid of him just cheering to start teaching me more and more. And um, like around high school, we really start connecting on a basketball level where at halftime we all talk about what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, um, things he saw, things I saw, and uh, our relationship, especially on the uh, basketball level was one of a kind. That's dope, man. And and I was reading an article where he said he used to take you out to Rucker Park to kind of make sure you, you kind of get that NYC yeah. roots in you to talk about that experience as a little kid. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, being from Queens and then living in Westchester, um, competition is good. But he was like, nah, you need to go right to Rucker. You need to play against the street players. And so... Uh, when I got out there, I, I took my lumps. I, I, I developed, I, I developed real quick because you know New York is either eating or you getting eaten alive. That's so, right. uh, <laughs> so I, I learned real quick of you know developing my game, and uh, that was a huge blessing for me because um, if I was just staying in that Westchester area, suburb area, I would have never developed that toughness. That's true. And and in that article, he said, if you can't play in NYC, you can't play basketball, man. So he, he yeah. threw you into the fire against the dogs, you know, to, to toughen you up. So that's that's a great story, man. Um, What do you feel like, you know, when I look at his game, yes, he played the three and a four and, and, and he was physical, but he had that finesse. He had those guard skills later on with the Knicks. He played point forward. His mid range was, was on point, but he could defend the two to three in the finals. He, he defended Elijah on a lot in those 94 finals. What do you? What part of his game did you admire the most, and, and what did you take to mold your game? Um, I admire everything about him. I know it sounds cliche, but uh, he's really my favorite player. If anybody asks me who's my favorite player, it's my dad. Just how he didn't take no for an answer, how he developed his own game, uh, molded himself into becoming an NBA player when nobody gave him a chance. Um, he found his niche being a hard nosed defender. And then he always had guard skills, especially when he was in college that he brought into the NBA and um, stopped becoming the point forward. And just seeing his development, um, you know, throughout his career, especially me being young and seeing it, it was kind of awesome, especially you don't really see anybody at 34, 35 making it to the all-star game. 
and um, having like one of the best seasons and later in their career. So um, I always admire how he got better every year. That, that then, was um, mm-hmm. Go ahead. And then for me, um, I kind of have the same physique body as him. So um, we worked out all the time, worked out all the time, basketball wise, weight wise. So um, I learned things from him. Uh, he always said he had better handles than me. He <laughs> he stuck to that. Um, but yeah, we will work on my ball handling, um, reading defenses, how to guard players, um, and just you know he saw skills that he always said I was more advanced than he was uh, at my age. So he will work on things and teach me things um, that kind of molded my my game. And it was kind of similar in a way to him, just in a guard position. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that in, in your game as well. And when you speak about his journey, it was so remarkable because, as I say, you know, as a kid, and I just jump in, and, and my recollection of basketball started with that group. But when you pull mm-hmm. it back and see the steps, the path that he took to get to the yeah. NBA, it was so remarkable that I, I made a video kind of documenting that journey and, and I sent it over to you, you know, from yeah. being rejected after the draft, being drafted by Portland in 88, being rejected, you know, being rejected by the Nets, going to the CBL in Turkey and Venezuela and that journey. Um, and then, as you said, becoming a six man of the year, becoming an all-star in his 11th season. I mean, some guys, the average playing career in the NBA is four years. And your mm-hmm. father's—he did thirteen, and then at the eleventh, he's an all-star. You know, yeah. uh, second-team defense, third-team All NBA, sixth man of the year. It, you know, his, his whole his whole resume once he was finished his career from where he started, it, it was absolutely incredible, mm-hmm. uh, absolutely incredible, man. What were like? I remember uh, when I was going through the video archives. I remember him having you at the finals, 94 finals, when they were celebrating on the court, beating the Pacers and the post-game press conferences. You you were, you were a baby then, but what were some of your earliest memories as him as an NBA player? Um, it was being in my mom's arms, watching the games. And, you know, I was really young, so I didn't understand basketball. But every time I heard his name, I just got excited and just start smiling. And she's tough. like, you hear him? You hear it? So as I heard that and then start growing up and understanding the game and then watching it and be able to see his career, then I start asking him questions about it. And he would tell me stories about pretty much his whole career and um, how he, you know, that journey that he took molded him, created his character of just play, play, you know, lights out, um, hard nose no matter what. And he did it his way. Um, that's the one thing he always say he did it his way. And, um, I, I totally respect the journey that he had. Absolutely, man. Very remarkable journey. And as you said, he did it his way. Do you remember any specific stories he used to tell you about his days with the Knicks, you know, certain games or his teammates or what were some of those stories that he used to share with you? Uh, he talked about the fights and practices. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he talked about uh, Raleigh sometimes suspending him before the Bulls games because yeah. he knew it would piss him off. So he could play like um, when they start playing the Bulls, he would be pissed off and locked in. So it was things like that that he was like. And I used to fall for it too. Like I used to get mad in practice, I get kicked out or whatever, and then get suspended, and then he'll put me back in and whatever, and then I. I'd be so pissed off and then he used to do it on purpose, but it still got me. So um, just hearing those stories and, you know, seeing him, uh, it, it, was, it was, you know, those memories I'll hold on uh, forever too. So it was kind of like the mind games at Riley, man. Riley yeah. knew what he was doing, man. He, he knew yeah, what yeah. he was doing. So <laughs> that, that's hilarious. And then the brawls with Xavier McDaniel. You know, I heard it from Xavier's side of things. Yeah. You know, that that was pretty funny, man. Um, did he ever talk about, you know, when he got traded to Charlotte? Did he ever, you know, speak on regret about leaving the Knicks? Did, did you know that? Um, uh, of course, he wanted to play for his home team, you yeah. know, the whole time. But uh, when he got traded... He didn't get down. He was kind of pissed off mm. and took it as revenge on the Knicks. Yeah. So, like, after he got traded, his his whole mentality was, I'm going to make them regret it. So, mm. as he was on the Hornets, you know, they played in the playoffs or whatever. But um, throughout his whole career, he, he was 
he he wanted to be a Nick Farmer. So throughout his whole career, he just said, you know what, uh, I'm gonna make people regret it, and he took it personal, like he always does. And um, you know, when he he was one person, when he put it in his mind, it wasn't gonna you, you couldn't stop him. Yeah, persistence, persistence personified, man, absolutely. Uh, who do who do you still keep in contact um, from from the '90s? You know, his old teammates. Are you still keeping contact uh, with those guys? Starks, Herb. Um, I keep in touch with John Wallace. I, I keep in touch with Oakley. Okay. Uh, yeah. So they're they're all my uncles. I consider them all my uncles. So I stay in touch with them. That, that's dope, man. Absolutely. Now, speaking of your own journey, you know, you, you were leading scorer to NCAA at once one point with with Niagara. You transfer mm-hmm. to Auburn. Your second leading scorer on the team. But at that same time is is when you know your father's health started to decline a little bit, and so. Mm-hmm. As you're pursuing your goals, you know, to go to the NBA, you're dealing with the pressures of the family and, and having to be there for your father. You know, talk about that time as far as trying to handle those two things. Uh, that was the toughest time of my life because um, it was so unexpected. Uh, he was actually, he came to a game like the week before he went to the hospital yeah. and, uh, you know, it, it was kind of, it's weird. Uh, like I said, we always worked out. So after practice, he um, had me doing drills and everything. And then we just sat in a gym and he was like, 2015 is going to be the hardest time of your life. Uh, if you could get through that, you could get through anything. And mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about, you know, coming off an ankle injury. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to recover. I'm like, I'm going to bounce back. And just so happened. I don't think he knew, but it, I don't know. I guess God was giving him a sign to prep me up. Um, and then he was sick. And during that time it was kind of like a blur because I was going to the hospital and I was fly back and I wasn't even going to play the rest of my season. Uh, I, I told him I'm staying with you until you get back. And he just kept shaking his head. No. And like, the heart rate start going up and I was like, mm-hmm. you want me to continue my season? And he was like, yes. So I, you know, took my mind off of my situation when I stepped on the court and just try to lock in and uh, finish my career. Right. And he actually um, <laughs> saw uh, the Kentucky game in the hospital. Um, and my mom was just telling me while he was watching it, he just had a huge smile. And uh, wow. that was going against uh, Devin Booker's, Carl Anthony Towns. That 29 team, points, so. right? Yep. 20, 29 and, points. Uh, yeah, and that was something we talked about because when I transferred to Auburn, I knew I was going to have to play those big names. And he was like, you ready for that? And I was like, yeah, I'm definitely ready. So I that game, um, until I watched it again, I was just in a, a total different zone. Mm. Uh I didn't even remember that game. I just knew I wasn't going to let him down that game. And, um, yeah, so when he passed, it was just hard on me. I stayed probably for a week and a half, two weeks, just at home. And my mom kind of said, you're not, you're not staying here. Mm. Your dad would want you to finish. So then I came back to Auburn. I think I had like a week before we had the SEC tournament. And um, I made the best of it, you know, played Kentucky again in the Final Four. We lost, but I had another good game against them. And after that, um, I kind of just needed a mental break Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for what was happening. But unfortunately, (laughs) things start speeding up. The NBA draft and the workouts, everything like that happened. And... um, after that, I was supposed to go to the G League, but um, my first agent kind of messed that up. Mm. So then I went overseas and um, just start developing. From then, I start finding the love of the game because it, it took, you know, losing somebody like that, it, it, it took the love out of the game because that was something that that special bond we had. But um, I start falling in love with the game again and. Uh, just remembering the things he said, especially at his journey, he told me, he was like, making it to the NBA isn't easy. He's like, especially what I had to do. I had to go overseas, 
get denied, go to overseas, get denied, and I finally made it. So it's kind of weird because I'm kind of taking the same path okay. as him. Yeah, so I know he's with me in this journey. Um, yesterday I had a game um, on his anniversary, mm-hmm. and um, I felt his presence, and we end up winning, and I had a good game, led us with 20 and 5. And uh, I just felt his presence talking to me, like, settle down and everything. So, it, you know, this journey is, is fun, um, challenging, and I know he's watching over me, so yeah. uh, I'll be ready for it. It's a beautiful thing, man. And, and you felt like as things were kind of spiraling, you felt like you, your mom was the one that kind of got you out of that yeah. rut? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's the the rock of the family. Um, you know, I always say she doesn't get the the light, you know, because obviously he's the NBA player, and then I start having my career. But she she holds it down. She motivates me, and uh, she's tough. <laughs> uh, I think I get the toughness from both of them. So um, yeah, she she's been motivating me and keeping me going and keeping my head straight. It's, it's great that you, you kind of take those traits from both your parents and, and that persistence, mm-hmm. that toughness as you go on along your journey. And as you said, it's it's, it's a similar path to what your father took to get yeah. to the league. And you feel like, you know, you kind of have that that determination to, to get there at any by any means necessary. So, yep. um, you know, keep, keep pursuing that, man. Definitely rooting for you, bro. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate that. Well, what are your thoughts on on the current state of the team, man? Right now, at as of this recording, fourth, fourth place, place in the East. You know, we're yeah, one game yeah. over five hundred. The city is rocking again. What's your yeah, thoughts on the, uh, What's your thoughts on the state of the team right now? I I, I love the Thibodeau <laughs> the Thibodeau effect. Uh, he has people playing defense. Um, Randall is having a, a heck of a season. Getting Derrick Rose back is is huge. Um, and then the young players developing. Um, some players, obviously, we would like to see develop faster, but um, I think they're in a good position. It'll be interesting to see if they make any uh, trades uh, coming to the trade deadline. But right now, they're, they're, they're pretty solid. We'll have uh, Robinson back from the injury. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's exciting to see in New York, you know, Brooklyn isn't the only team that yeah. that's being talked about. That That's a fact, man. I got to tell you, I mean, for covering this team every single game, this yeah. this is great, man. The, the vibes are great. The fan base is energized. The defense is, is amazing. You know, the defense, mm-hmm. we, we did not expect – this team to improve that drastically on defense from the previous regimes. You know, usually you take in- incremental steps up, yeah. and as you get more defensive-oriented players, you know, the, your def- you expect that to elevate. But right away, Thibodeau has left his mark on this team. It seems like they got something brewing in terms of the culture kind of changing. Julius is in his bag. You know, Kenny Payne, and you, you, I'm sure you've had experience with Kenny mm-hmm. Payne playing in the SEC. His impact mm-hmm. on on Julius and some of those Kentucky guys seems to be evident there. Yeah. So it, it's just been it's been night and day, man. And as you said, the Rose acquisition has been really good too. So second half yeah. of the season is gonna be entertaining, man. I'm telling you, yeah, second definitely half is will. gonna be a good and then, one. And then you know, it, it works when uh, everybody is being held accountable, especially you know young players. They come into the league. Some people, you know, it, it's very important to get the right vets or the right coaching staff to develop them. And if we have everybody accountable, it's no slacking off. Um, and you can see it in, in, in the play. And it's, it's exciting because they're scoring, but they're working hard on both ends. Yeah. And it's, it's very fun to watch. Yeah, and as you said, the right vets. You know, your father's former teammates that I had on the show, Derek Harper, um, they would say Xavier McDaniels, they say the same thing. you got to have the right vets on the team to, you know, mm-hmm. kind of compliment these young guys and, and help carry it forward. And Tibbs being that old school coach certainly believes yeah. in that. And and I think, as you said, with Rose in here, Randall and so on, they're, they're certainly um, they're playing well, man. Happy to see it. Yeah. They're definitely yeah. happy to see it, man. But um, Antoine, listen, man, I, I definitely appreciate all the time that you gave us. You know, as I said, you, your father was a beloved 
figure in this city and, and for this team, one of my favorites. I had the opportunity to meet him back in 2014 at Clyde's Wine and Dine, and he, he wasn't even expected to be there. I think it was just like a Monday night football event, and we were there. Yeah. All of a sudden, I turn around, and it's Anthony Bates. I said, yo, it was <laughs> it was crazy, yeah. man. And it's just a you know, short interaction. I just said, what up? And we took mm-hmm. a picture, but something I, I'll never forget, man. So, you know, I, I always send my condolences to you. I, I wish you nothing but I success in, in your journey. And uh, hopefully we do this again, man. Hopefully we get you on a post game yeah. show, get you on a round table, and they make the playoffs. It'll be fun, man. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. And yeah, go New York. <laughs> yeah, man. Absolutely, Antoine. Best of luck to you, man.